You're familiar with the Owen Benjamin Bears. I'm not good with Americana. <laughs> it's fine. You're uh, not missing anything. Yeah, let's see here. Um, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. So oh, I'm getting the feedback. That's good. Looks like we're live. Uh, okay, guys, welcome. I'm going to hit record and fire this bad boy up. We're good. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I believe we're good. Awesome. We are live on Rumble, Odyssey, YouTube, DLive, and Sayer G's Unite.live, also Fakebook. And I think that's it. So, hey, guys, join us. We're on your favorite platform. Doesn't have to be YouTube, even though YouTube still seems to have the most pop and chat for now. Loosh tube, we call it, Jane. And okay. uh, we stay on YouTube just to uh, hopefully be somewhat of an annoyance to them to the point of, uh, you know, getting removed, which they do to us from time to time. And also we get, um, you know, a lot of new kind of normies that are riding the fence. And so, you know, we still use them, but uh, it's inevitable. Someday we will be canceled. It's a discovery tool. A lot of people discover us just like why we use Instagram still. And, and Bear, by the way, your electroculture video yesterday I posted as a reel has gone somewhat um, take. It's taken off. I hate to say the word viral because that's just, <laughs> um, but it's uh, like got, got like twenty four thousand views in a day, and um, yeah, people are loving it. A couple uh, naysayer normie haters on there, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm looking forward to the electroculture talk. We could actually touch on that a little bit today, Jane, because that is kind of antiquitech uh tartaria related technology there really so um okay let me hit record and we will get going and boom we're back for another episode of alpha cast i'm mike winner and i'm here as always with the electroculture electroculturing permaculture uh doctor uh, renegade cowboy dr bear paul lando uh coming to you live and direct from the great state of jefferson here where freedom still reigns supreme on the smith river the azure flowing waters of the beautiful smith spring is in full effect we got big puffy clouds all week bear i haven't seen a chemtrail in sight for for a long time i think all the organite i put in last year has really been doing wonders uh, and uh, all the good intentions. I thought and all the, those uh, tic-tac-toe boards in the sky were just normal. Uh, that is a tic-tac-toe, though. That's a good point, right? That's the game they're playing. And uh, it looks like we've been kinged. So <laughs> we're coming back pretty pretty strong here, man, with this wonderful Antiqua Tech, which we'll talk about a bit today with our beloved guest. Jane Evershed. Uh, just a couple notes real quick before we start. Uh, uh, Bear, you are coming up on a, another summit, right, that you're doing. I, I saw in our uh, newsletter this week, uh, which is cool. Um, that's that's launching very soon, right? You're like Tom Cowan's in that, a couple other folks. Yeah, uh, quite a few people are in it. So that was fun. That's going to be airing. And anybody that's interested, maybe you just put the link in the show notes or something. And I put it in the mailer that I put out for this episode yesterday. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it's good. You, you know, Jane, I heard you. Uh, we'll give you a proper uh, hello and introduction here in a second. So forgive us. Um, but yeah. Um, I heard you saying that, you know, it's it's quite an effort just to reach people, you know, with your mission, which is so important to bring the artistic side back uh, or element, uh, you know, back into our culture. And, um, you know, we really I don't think, you know, we're just a small venue ourselves. We have our own little following. But if you put all of us together together. The numbers are phenomenal. So we're all doing our own little part and we don't have to look at ourselves or any one of us as, as the one that's going to do it. It's And that's what uh, the classic definition of decentralization is, is you have many strong, independent, free-thinking units that all will come together when they need to, but then also not restrict each other at the same time. So we're winning this. Uh, Mike, uh, I'll let you get into okay. it. And uh, just real quick, you're going to lose me for 30 seconds here. 
uh, if I look frozen on the screen because I have to switch to a different modem. So you're I'll zapping be right out back. of the <laughs> you're zapping out of the ethers on us. Okay. Well, I just realized I was on Starlink and I'm going into oh, a different you... one that uh, doesn't zap out as much. How dare you use that those those balloons? Um, the uh, uh, reawaken masterclass is what it's called. The bears be uh, will be featured on, and then we have the end of COVID coming. Uh, June 20th, guys, the end of COVID.com. Uh, uh, check that out. Bear is, uh, and I've done a number of wonderful discussions there. It uh, It's funny because they finally come out and said it's the pandemic, the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, is over. And then you've got Billy Gates talking about 2025 now uh, being the next, <laughs> the next event. So uh, we know the game and the whole point of that uh, summit, that educational platform is to end all of the nonsense finally with true education around terrain and ideas about uh, really what disease is and what it means to be healthy. So check that out. And uh, Bear, I know we've been saying this forever, but um, I was talking with Jacob today. The site is pretty money, man. We are like so close, uh, weeks away, if not less, to launch the new Alphabetic platform i know people we've been talking about this for like exciting. a year um very very exciting so um awesome. okay jump into this uh beautiful introduction here uh as the alpha vedic community is well aware the official historical narrative is less authentic than science fiction fantasy on this week's alpha cast we'll entertain an eclectic list of topics ranging from tartaria prehistoric cave paintings, the divine feminine, and a few other surprises in between. Artist and historian Jane Evershed will be at the helm of this exploration, and her artistic talents and rich life experience will make this a not-to-be-missed episode. Jane came to live in the U.S. in Minneapolis in 1984. In that same year, she won the Minneapolis Metro Transit Bus Design Award, after which she launched a career marketing journals, books, large prints, and note cards of her art, which she marketed across the U.S. and in many other countries. Quote, art has always been to show the higher self striving for the zenith aesthetic. What happened to that high notion? Did art become reduced to a means of laundering money, perhaps? Did art fall martyr to art itself in the age of digital gods? Oil painting like stained glass windows are as sure a part of life as growing a garden. These skills must not be lost to humankind. Artificial intelligence is poised right now to take over the role of artists. During this time, she spoke at many universities and colleges, sharing her art and poetry, winning awards and various commissions. In 1994, HarperCollins published a book of her art and poetry. In 2000, Jane transformed her home into a gallery and fundraising venue in Kenwood, Minneapolis. In 2006, Jane went to live in the woods of Wisconsin for seven years to gather her thoughts and reinvent her life as an artist, where she continued to paint and evolve her style without the constraints of everyday life. Upon her return to Minnesota, Jane began her Remembering the Divine Feminine series as a natural evolution from her earlier Power of Woman and other series that spoke to environmental degradation. Jane's work is ultimately inspired by nature and our relationship to it. She observes the genius of the natural world and allows it to determine lines of life on the canvas that often evolve into otherworldly dimensions and states of consciousness not yet arrived at by our slow evolution. Examples of these would be leaving time, steps to higher dimensions, and chanting destiny, to name a few of her latest works. Jane believes that certain forces took over Western culture during the Renaissance and force-fed their flawed culture to the world. We'll also discuss her theory that the prehistoric cave art found in France and Spain is a forgery created in modern times. Most germane to our discussion is the impact of these events are on our present world. Art is the salvation. It is what makes man, what man and woman, what we are today bear. Uh, very close to our hearts, this topic, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, Jane, such a, a delight to have you with us today. Uh, thank you. And and we had a very uh, fun conversation this morning. So it's, it's really good getting to know you. Um, uh, right off uh, the bat there, uh, yeah, your colors, your background there is just marvelous. And uh, thank you for bringing that to us. You know, uh, your 
uh, your pink um, is, uh, since we're going to be talking about divine feminine a little bit today, uh, and I also heard you mention the word ascension a couple times in uh, some of your previous episodes, and uh, Ascended Master Lady Nada, uh, from uh, who's well known through the original Ascended Master works, not the New Agey stuff, uh, she was a master of the pink ray. And uh, when you understand what that ray is, as far as, uh, you know, the divine feminine and also the heart center, and just uh, one that I use uh, very frequently in pranic healing, you know, in my work. So uh, it's wonderful to see those colors, you know, just kind of cheers me up instantly. Um, you know, we we're talking a little bit earlier about uh, bringing art back into our culture as a evolutionary tool of consciousness and how it's been really systematically removed. And, you know, with the final nail on the artistic coffin is uh, AI. But, um, you know, when I left conventional medicine, and as I was telling you, uh, I really was just intuiting that something big was missing from what I was doing. So I went back in my studies and that led me for many years into the old alchemical te uh, text and then to put it into practice in medicine and also in my alchemical laboratory, I found that while wow, these principles are actually valid and they do work, but more importantly, I realized that everything, including the practice of medicine is not just a science, it is an art. And that is what's been removed from medicine in this day and age. And not only did that allow me to um, practice my vocation with better efficacy, but it also made me realize that, yeah, I, my chosen vocation was to help others, but it was also to help me. And by practicing it as an art form, it was very, and continues to be very instrumental in my own personal evolution. And that's so important that we don't just read about art or read about alchemy or permaculture farming, whatever, like the old alchemist said, um, you know, it's, you have to do the work. And I see more and more people now doing the work and what it's doing is creating a parallel uh, universe, we'll say. So as this other one inevitably um, crumbles, then some of us that have chosen this will have a soft uh, landing and also softer landing and also a haven for other people that need support. So uh, welcome. And uh, you just have such a rich experience, life experience. And maybe we could just jump right into it with uh, a historical perspective, because I think everything bases on that. If we don't know the history and the why, then it's hard to really go in depth in anything else. So maybe we could start with uh, one of Michael and I's favorite topics, which is Tartaria and how uh, Putin, who has been greatly demonized as of late for many reasons, which I know you'll get into that for us, uh, you know, revealed the Tartarian map. So if you think that's a good starting place, um, that would be welcome or anything else that you think you'd like to say first. Well, first, I would like to ask you if you did art when you were a kid. I did. There you um, go. And I did a lot, and I actually found that um, I could look at a face and reproduce it in pencil line drawings so it would look very much like the real thing. And then I kind of gave it up uh, and haven't done it for a while. Well, it, because it served its purpose, and this is the mm -hmm. most incredible thing about art. If you don't mind me hopping over Tartaria just for a second, because you are the Please. perfect and prime example of what I am trying to get across to people about how important art is and why every child must do art. And people think that they can just go buy paints and a canvas and splash around and maybe it'll look nice one day and maybe it won't the other day. But the thing is, you do have to learn to study the basics, which I know you did because you had portraits that looked like the people that you were drawing. And from this exercise as a child, we learn how to take components on this plane of matter 
and we learn to connect with cosmos as we arrange the elements on the canvas or the drawing or whatever it is. And through that exercise as an adult, we learn to take other areas of matter, gases, whatever it is, and, and put them into a harmonious composition. And you've done exactly that with your life's work and your journey. You have made of it an art. And it has its roots in your studying art as a child. And sadly, what's happened is the children are walking around with devices in their hand and they're being programmed from the exterior in and nothing's coming out. And so they're debilitated and, and they're... They're not exercising their creative potential. And this is uh, really hard on humanity because our creation and our creativity is akin to and connected to prime creator. And when we cut that thread to prime creator, we are not who we are anymore. And this is why the arts are so important because and also Tartaria, they engaged all elements of the art. They used the ether. They incorporated it into their daily lives. They literally brought heaven to earth. And this is where we have to return to this mission of bringing heaven to earth in any way that we can. I'm not saying art is the be all and end all. I'm saying that it's a big part of it. And you're the perfect example. Jane, uh, proud papa here. My my kids do art. My son actually just took first place with a local art contest. This is a spray paint, a spray paint art he did. Um, so yeah, we're we're always injecting that element into my children's life every day, and having I, them draw, yeah. doing uh, yeah, that kind of stuff, and not being on the screen so much. Yeah. And, and, you know, my oldest son, Michael, is a brilliant artist. So even though I gave up uh, drawing and painting, I lived that vicariously through my oldest son, who we encouraged to be an artist. And to this day, not only has he developed his, his artistic talents, but also actually makes a good living out of it. Um, you know, a uh, thing that's important that most people don't realize, you know, we do live in this world of polarities. It's because it's all electrical phenomena. That includes our senses. Each of our senses, we'll just take sight as an example, has two sides. It has the receptive and the proactive creative side. So if we're just simply receiving and then not imagining out into the outer world, our version of you know what we're perceiving, then we're really passing up the whole reason for our individualization in the first place. So and, and of course, I think we'll probably get a little bit more in depth with you about uh, maybe why some people want us purely receptive. Well, I don't know, but I think the most important part that's overlooked when creating art is that you get to a point where you lose time. And that is the part where the connection happens with the cosmos the outside information starts pouring in, you get into the flow, you just start creating without thinking. And when you reach that point, that's almost like nirvana. That's many people try to reach that state through meditation or whatever they try to do, just going out in nature. But you can reach it through the method of being creative. Even if you're just doodling, if you get into it, you know, there's that moment where you, lose yourself in it that's the magical moment yeah, and there's, yeah, a, I there's an analog element to that too where as you're mentioning time where it's not the zeros and ones so much like we're doing here right now which is there's an art form to doing pod there's an art to everything right if it's a creative flow but specifically drawing and 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 painting there's sort of analog waveform uh, integration you're doing uh, through the time and the matter and everything. I think that is like what the alchemists talk about. You're transmuting things through your imagination, other things in the natural world. And I think that's a very important aspect to countering the uh, sort of wannabe AI takeover <laughs> right now. 
Right. They can't. They never will because they don't have a soul. And it's your soul exactly. that is connecting with that energy source, the prime source creator, which is also why we're getting um, infiltrated on a nano level with all these poisons because this is their greatest threat. And I'm saying they, and I can explain they, but I'm sure everybody knows who they is. But they know that our creativity as humans is their greatest threat. So they have to harvest it for their ends, their means, their purposes, their agenda. So I would ask everyone to look at where their creativity, I call it, creation currency where their creation currency is being invested and could they please pretty please take their creation beautiful creation currency and invest it in the positive evolution of humanity that would be very nice thank you and as soon as you start doing service to others instead of service to self you are serving yourself that seems to be a concept that escapes the uh, would-be controllers. You know, we live in a two-way give-give universe. And, uh, you know, that's one of the main uh, principles of all time. So um, unless you'd like to um, just elaborate a little bit more on what we're talking about, and then, and then maybe we can uh, segue into why historical lines have been altered why different civilizations have been subterfuged uh wherever you doubt uh, well it, yeah i don't really go back into millions of years ago i'm looking as far back as maybe the 10th century where all the persecutions began the diaclonicious persecutions and um, I'll just tell you right now that the word Christian, when you look at the etymology of it, it, it was a very derogatory term. That was, you know, you were, you were lesser than, you were a cretin. And so I, I try to avoid the word Christian, but I want to say here that there was a spiritual element upon this earth that was so pure and so beautiful and so connected to nature and so connected to the ethers and the cosmos. And that, and that was not a material existence at all. And it was, it, there was no covet and greed and trying to make money at that point in time and this is what they sought to destroy because their world is so material and it has been focused in a long line especially since the renaissance when all this was established so what happened was the roman catholic church no offense to anyone who's a catholic they took humanity and guided it from that point during the Renaissance in the 1400s, where they absolutely X'd out all the indigenous people, literally went around the world slaughtering and killing them and calling that the age of discovery. And they left out all the women too. They have an absolute aversion to women and the divine feminine that had to be out as well. And they established going forward what I call academentia because it promotes the great forgetting. And they established that academentia within the closed system of the philosophy of only white male men. And so once you close the door on all the indigenous peoples and their spirituality and all the women, you've lost over half of the world of humanity for your input into our future going forward for our positive evolution. And it's so biased that within that closed system, you can never take it seriously because it's missing these vast elements of our divinity. Sorry, Absolutely. Did, you ask, did you ask me to take that? I got, I got. Well, and, and of course you have like the modern feminism movement, which is the inversion of that, right? That has been put forth by control systems to 
um, make it look all rosy and inclusive and that this is for the benefit finally of, of parody, but really it's quite the opposite. And you can, it's nothing more apparent now than the whole trans movement that's been injected into that, where we now have grown men with large packages winning NCAA swim meets <laughs> and, and for the purpose of female liberation, right? I mean, it's such an inverted slap in the face to women. I think um, it, it, it's key that we understand this, right? We understand how these controllers flip the switch all the time. This is very much connected to art because we, we're talking visuals. So we're getting slapped in the face with these visuals all the time. Like I'm, I'm sure you can remember the first time you probably saw a bearded man with a woman's hairstyle and dressed as a woman. And when you first looked at it, you, you kind of like did a double take, but then you kind of got used to it and then it, it infiltrates into the system. These visuals infiltrate into the system until you get used to it. And Mike, what you touched on there about women, the only time they were ever allowed to cross the threshold into this closed system is when it became um, a, at the point where it served the agenda. And that goes for all indigenous peoples, all brown, all black, all the women, they can only come in if they are serving an agenda. And I knew that when I was doing my Power of Women series, because as soon as I flipped over to the divine feminine, all the doors shut in my face. And it doesn't just hurt women. Of course, it, it hurts uh, the male species as well. And not to uh, you know mention uh, also that no matter what spacesuit we're wearing, male or female, we have both polarities. And so, you know, men do not need to become feminine, but it is also helpful if you're, you know, exhibiting that male polarity to also have those female attributes as a balance. And uh, also in, uh, you know, at one time, every race and color was indigenous. So this group of, uh, you know, what we look at as white males are, are basically screwing over everybody. It's just, I think, more in recent times, you know, certain races have taken more of a brunt. But as Russell Means, who was the uh, head of the American uh, Indian nation, you know, not that long ago before he passed, his famous statement is that we're all on the reservation now. And then, but people on the reservation would take offense to that and call you, call it assimilation. So you can never win. So let's just say there's the yeah. divine feminine and the divine masculine, and that's the end of the story. And we all love Sounds each good. other. Agreed. You know, I'm, not, Agreed. I'm not by any means anti-male or anything like that. Oh, I, I wouldn't think that. So, um, yeah, it's it's just amazing. The the psyop is 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 brilliant, actually, if you want to look at it in a devious way. And it's been going on for a while. And and as you said, you know, you don't have to go back millions of years because I think the further back you go, there is actually some good times on this planet. Uh, you know, before it was all uh, subverted into what we see today. So um, I think maybe you could speak on the fact that. There were civilizations uh, and nation states and peoples that actually interacted, got along and engaged in commerce and cultural exchange. And there, we didn't see all the problems. So I think it's possible. And part of the narrative seems to be making us believe that war is inevitable and peace is uh, a, a distant fantasy. Well, are they obviously from the architecture of Tartaria and the antiquitech that it had, and the fact that all the res resonating sounds and everything that came out of those buildings sitting on those ley lines was healing the people, healing the populace. The level of creativity had reached its zenith for sure, because you know that people who are creating such beauty with such detail in every aspect and so thoughtful 
they weren't running out from eight to five every day and then rushing back home to carry on sculpting and carving. You know, you know they had a way that they existed and lived and thrived without being on a treadmill, which we are on today. So this has, was planned so well that it would leap for generations into the future to the point where we have come today where we almost accept it as a normal existence to go out and have a job or to go to work. Or I, I, just, I just cannot stand spending time trying to make money myself. <laughs> you know, I think it's just blasphemous upon our creativity to do that. But we all have to, you know, because we've all got these bills which are all mostly about energy, which Tartaria had completely solved that issue and so we're going backwards in time as we move forward. And that is why also that the, the historic caves were, were faked so that we would think we came from apes and where we came to now, we come so far. Look at our progress, it's just amazing. And the truth is we've just been going on a decline ever since they wanted to belittle us by telling us that we came from apes and then bedazzle us with all the progress from like these great world fairs they had where they would display everything and say look what we have this vacuum cleaner and a lawnmower and all this stuff we have we're just so into the modern world now and yet the the thing behind that was that they were moving into this uber material realm. And, and that's where they wanted us all to go. And we all moved with them into this horror story that we live now. So the Renaissance is a very fascinating time. And uh, I've heard you speak on, uh, now I've, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but just kind of my take on it, maybe the first attempt to institutionalize art or the first, uh, the first level of pop art, maybe, even though we consider that the classics. And maybe you could speak on um, what art really meant at that time and then how certain personalities became synonymous with the Renaissance and, and how that happened. Well, once they had uh, taken over the Tartarian realm, especially in Rome in the beginning. I think Rome was probably one of the earliest places where that happened. Um, they had plundered that, that whole society with all their classical statues and sculptures and frescoes. And, and, and it's very generic. Everything is in proportion and it's very perfect. And I believe the Tartarians had some kind of technology or methodology to reproduce realistically the human form in both 3D and two dimensionally. So by the time these infiltrators came along, who in the heck knows where they came from, I think they usurped these buildings and these frescoes, these famous frescoes you hear about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and Raphael and this dome and that fresco, they were repairing it and they were fixing it and they were cleaning it up. And then they were using it as a launch pad to launch themselves. Think of the Pope on his balcony waving to the masses who think that it's so close to God. <laughs> You know, once you put yourself in that position, you look pretty damn good to the rest of the world. And so what happened was they either were repairing those frescoes, they were collecting antique, they called it ancient Greek and Roman sculpture, but it was recent from Tartaria. And we can go into that if you like. That goes into uh, Scaligari and the false rewriting of history and ancient history and making up history and adding a thousand years to history. And then when Fomenko comes along, he takes that thousand years out of there and then suddenly everything comes into focus and perspective. And Michelangelo himself, you know, immediately you just think, great sculptor of the enlightenment. 
and it couldn't be further from the truth. He started out, his luck went very well when he did this forgery and he was invited to Rome in order to continue making forgeries from these found objects, which were from really from Tartaria. And they would bury them under the ground for a while and bring them out, they'd look all aged, and then they would be selling them all over Europe. And so that's where he started. And my smoking gun picture for Michelangelo is in Jacopo Galli's garden. Somebody had drawn a sketch of a statue of Dionysus and his arm was, his hand was missing. And then later you see the sculpture come up and it's Michelangelo's sculpture, it's all of a sudden. And then uh, there was another case where the people around Michelangelo at that time, they didn't believe that he made the Pieta, you know, the woman, Mary holding Christ dead across her lap. And so he went and scrawled his name across her chest. That I did do this. You know, this kind of behavior, it just gives him away. The other thing was he said that nobody was ever allowed into his studio. Nobody ever saw him working. And I could just go on and on with examples like Raphael. Everybody's raving about Raphael. Well, he was 37 when he died. He was an orphan. And so if, even if he started working when he was 16 years old, that would give him about 20 years to do this incredible body of work that includes designing palaces and frescoes and sculptures and paintings. And, and then on top of that, he was also said to be ill because he had syphilis. And it just goes on and on and on where you, where you look at everything, you put it together and you, you see this is a lie. And, and don't get me started on uh, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> so you mean Charlton Heston's portrayal of Michelangelo wasn't true to life? <laughs> well, and we know Michelangelo was uh, the patron, right? His patron was Medici. So that goes down a whole sort of dark uh, hallway of questionable <laughs> history there and antics they're related to, you know, the dark magicians and all that. Uh, <laughs> well, the Medici's literally owned Rome and Italy for a block of, of 300 years. There was only 20 years in there where people went against them, that they weren't in power. And they they also decided to be the popes as well without ever being a cardinal or a priest or anything mm -hmm. so they were the banking family and they represented the roman catholic church so you can imagine exactly you know how, what they did well, and what they were up to many say who are they i mean that's a good indication of who they are they called yeah. like what the black nobility and that goes all the way to modern times of like the Club of Rome and Jesuits and all that. It's all related. So interesting that that would be the patron of supposedly these artists, right, who are bringing back neoclassism, which in my mind, it's interesting, Jane. It's like because we're looking at AI right now, right? And it's just replicating other people's work and putting a synthesis of, of ideas together. It just And that's essentially this. It's just a digital version of what they were doing back then in yeah. many ways. I always say that the dealing in all these ancient sculptures was just like crypto today. You know, it was an easy way to make money, just go find it and sell it. <laughs> but but more than that, the Sforzas were the ones that got to Leonardo. Uh, Leonardo also said that the Medicis made him and the Medicis destroyed him. But the Sforzas were the ones who was cutting up bodies, going inside the human body, getting him to cut. They had they owned the first hospital in Milan and they were the ones where he was creating these weapons of mass destruction, like the human slicer that he invented. He invented robots as well, um, weapons of war. He, was, he started it off, this mechanical weapon of war genre that, that eventually became the first world, the industrial revolution, and then the first world war. So I don't know if you have an answer to this, but we have, all right, a civilization, Tartaria, and then existing, coexisting 
were these people that are doing these atrocities and trying to cover up the civilization. So where uh, do you have any idea of, of where they emanate from? Um, you know, we're not just talking about individuals, but uh, and, and how they were able to cover up an entire civilization. Did it coincide with natural cataclysms that uh, then they were able to capitalize on that? Uh, well, that what kind of information do you have on that? Yeah. That's such a good question, honestly. Well, just as they do today, they could foment disease. And there's, I traced it. I'd have to look in my notes for exact times, dates, and names. But I remember there was a very powerful plague that came from out of Italy and went out as they were traveling around. They took it with them, which helped them kill off many indigenous peoples. and. So we have that, and then I know that that there was millions and millions of Tartarians that were killed by famine, and um, I don't know where these perpetrators actually came from, but their history tells us they were very malevolent. You know, okay, go back to King Herod. Who goes running around killing all the babies that are two years old and under? in a certain area just to go after the fact that maybe a Christ consciousness had been born within that realm, you know? So I don't know who these people are or where they came from, but I know that they don't have a soul and I know that they're masquerading as human. They're not human. They are alien to us. And I think it's important to understand for all of us that since they lack a soul, that level of sentience, then they need us for their currency because they have no creativity. So they have to harness our consciousness to create the world they want to see. So that puts us right back in the driver's seat as soon as we wake up. Right. Our that, currency is worth way more than any gold or platinum or anything that they have. And that's why I opened this up with calling uh, one of the platforms we're on Loosh Tube, because there is this notion coming out of um, a lot of the, like the Middle Eastern spiritual traditions about Loosh, right? Is, is the energy that they harvest. Are you, are you familiar with that term, Jane? Yeah. Loosh or, yeah. yeah, chi or prana, right. you know? Yeah. It, and it's what we see is it's the fear, right? It's the fear matrix that generates that currency for them. And, um, and so I, I do get a little challenged sometimes with this sort of pop Gnosticism that's become very trendy, that a demiurge created this plane and this realm and that, uh, you know, we're all victim to this these circumstances. I believe that is kind of playing right into the dark magician's narrative that there's that we are disempowered from the beginning when actually, no, it's as Bear was just stating, we are the ones that are the power plants of this realm of this area and the tartarians understood that with their antiqua deck and the grand delusion is that we are the we don't have that power and that uh so yeah i think it's very important for for us to go deeper into that with this discussion if we can where that power comes from and how to harness that power and of course as you say through art and through the creative aspects around art well i'm just showing you just what i know from my personal experience because I have been painting now for almost 50 years and I put down my paintbrushes and I decided I'm going to look at this element, that element, this, I'm going to bring it all together in my own canvas of what I think, which is a perfect example of what I'm trying to convey here about how powerful art really is. Art does change the world. It's just not necessarily the piece of art that you create that means that much. It's the process of creating that art. And you're right about that loosh. It's infiltrated everything. But we can say we have evolved from Tartaria in a way because I think that we, when we realize we are the cathedral and that our connection to the cosmos that's our antiquitech and we hold all these things within us and our resonance what we put out there is what 
we can heal with our hands. I'm sure that would be the number one reason that the that the Romans wanted to kill Christ because they were just starting to go into dissecting the human body, chopping it up, looking inside. You have no business in our bodies. Get out. They're perfect. We were made absolutely perfectly. And we can heal with our hands. We don't need any of it. We don't even need the science. The science is just words that explain the physical phenomena of what goes on because we are the phase conjugators ourselves we're we're all of it we're the radiant energy we're the electrodynamics we are all of it and with this realization we shift into this golden age that we are trying to create here and we're getting waylaid by all this fear and everything and false flags and terrible news but if we all really focus on this positive evolution element and start thinking, this is my little place in rearranging this timeline. Where do I fit? You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be anything. You just have to be you. In your perfection, you fit perfectly into this puzzle of creating this new golden age, which is so close. You can smell it. You can taste it. You can even hear it. You know, in uh, the alchemical arts, there's a saying when you're making medicines in your lab that you have to have a, a great knowledge of the constellations and the heavens above. And in fact, the medicine is the stars. And our physical vehicles are the perfect technology that if... Um, cared for properly and understood would be a capacitor for that resonance. And the main um, mission statement I had in, you know, my decades of uh, work as a so-called doctor was to make doctors obsolete. Uh, Michael and I had a little uh, discussion on, um, on this recent event, the end of, you know, what, and that we, isn't that nonsense? We can't even say a word here without getting censored. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, I was discussing from the perspective of a biotrained physician, all the things I had to go through for years to learn what I needed to learn. And then the question was posed to me, well, um, what do we do? Because there's no doctors around that really have incorporated those things, nor are there places to learn that anymore. And my response was, well, we never needed any of that in the first place. And I'm just you know, agreeing with you, uh, you know, you don't need technology, you don't need doctors, you don't even need alternative doctors. I realize we're kind of a bridge to that level of consciousness, uh, you know, and that's our true purpose. But I sooner see all doctors, including myself, become obsolete as soon as possible. Well, you're a healer, you're a healer, and you're working with the earth. And, you know, um, we, let's lose the word doctor and still be who we really are. Mm -hmm. absolutely so there's like there's essentially uh, the art is in the art of being living man and woman and uh i know of great artists that are uh work out in the garden here or that are carpenters right like the nazarene <laughs> um there is an art i loved what you just what you said there jane there is an art in being uh, true to yourself and being authentic and following your divine path and that word divine, that's the other word that they've, of course, pushed out of the dial, you know, within the dialectic that they have us focused on, right? Instead of the divine, which is which is crucial for this understanding of, as you say, the golden age understanding. But that art, the art of being me is so important. And it's like, find what you love to do and do it. And they will, the universe will work with you. It will open up and allow your path to come through. You know, I'm, I've never been without, I had my house taken away. They grabbed my house in the woods, which sent me back to Minnesota. I literally had nothing but myself. So honestly, the, 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 the universe, when you connect to it and you, your intentions, I hate the intentions, but um, what can I say? When you're true to yourself and your purpose and you can find your purpose the universe just does. It just looks out for you and makes sure that you have everything you need. 
It's it's a magical thing that nobody believes. Especially telling the truth too, telling the truth and and um, you know abiding by a moral code. There is that too, because there is good and there's evil. <laughs> there is definitely a good versus evil thing going on right now. And when you are applying the life principle towards harmonious integration, right through love, synchronicities happen everywhere. It's yeah. like it's pretty easy, actually. <laughs> it really is. I, mean, I haven't been to a doctor in 30 years, so therefore I just decided I'm not going to get sick. It's just like that, you know? I mean, of course, if I was in a terrible accident, I'd need to go to a doctor, but it just works that way. You set your own standards and you don't cross the line and you'll see that the universe will work with you in whatever it is you want to do. You don't necessarily have to be an artist, but you do have to be tap into your creativity. And the reason you need to just grab a pen right now and sit there and start doodling is because you're firing up those sleepy old neurons that have been snoozing away in your head for so long. And you have to keep those alive and keep those fired up and connected to your heart as well. And the process of painting too is the hand, the heart and the mind connected to the greater realm of the wisdom and the universal laws of the cosmos. This is what's happening when you're painting. But what you get told at school is, oh, look, I made a pretty picture, which brings me to this. <laughs> um, this is my book I wrote specifically for this reason. Anyone who is um, art frozen or anything, it's got all the main basic steps. It's very simple. It's easy to read. I'm, you know, I don't make any money off this, believe you me but I put out there as my tool to the world so that they could actually use it to teach children or they could use it to teach themselves the process of art so that they have the basics and they're not just flying by the seat of their pants, you know, just to create a painting for the sake of painting. This is brilliant. I think you're inspiring me to uh, get back into it a little bit again, you know? You know, well, as far as uh, look, I was just going to say, sorry, as me, but look at modern art, what they've done to it, right? What the institution has done to it with modern art, where you can slap a banana peel on a wall and and put that in a gallery, right? So, and I think that was supposed to be a reaction against with technology, with the photograph and everything, right? And with that, that replicating reality uh via you know even like impressionism which was actually a revolt against the camera but but the idea was well art now needs to represent sort of uh the the class struggle and they related it to politics they related it to all these things and they got away from the divine of course and they overthought everything and i just don't get modern art anymore it's i mean i never did um but uh, <laughs> it's your perspective is interesting and in my research where I'm, I started with prehistoric, went to Renaissance, and now I'm actually working on the modern art end of it. Um, I was physically ill after <laughs> looking at all the images and it's a further distortion. You know, once you were an ape and you looked like this Neanderthal goofball with a club, but now <laughs> when you look at the faces, the fragmentation, um, this is this is MK Ultra. You've always got a distorted face or a fragmented fake cubism. Think of Picasso and cubism, who, by the way, was inspired by going to the Trocadero in France, which was um, the World Fair Center, the archaeological World Fair Center in 1907. And he went there and that's where he saw the tribal mosques that they had plundered mm. from all these indigenous rampages around the world and that was the root and the beginning of modern art so even that was stolen from the indigenous people usurped and then used to absolutely um entrain us to continue to believe that we are the this ugly deformed mentally disabled 
species. You just see it over and over again. It has to be a part of it. And at the same time, too, they themselves in France and London and the United States, they usurped all these incredible buildings from Taria with the columns and beautiful buildings to display the art in. Well, nowadays they, they realize how silly it looks to have some of this stuff they call art in such a gorgeous building. So they had to build kind of some freaky buildings to display their contemporary art. But um, yes, it, modern art is another psyop. It's a, it's a mess. It's just like Hollywood, you have your celebrities. Um, it's all about money and laundering, as I, as I, you know, I said in that bio that you've dug up and read, which I haven't seen for years, but well done, you did a great job. <laughs> and um, I, I forget what the instrument is called. I'm kind of going back to the Renaissance time and, and how some of those folks were plagiarizing and reproducing in that way. There's an instrument I, I know you'll be more aware of um, where it you take an image and it goes through a magnification and projects on your paper. I was just um, reading about that because they're becoming more in vogue and people marketing those now. And they're mm -hmm. saying that even Michelangelo and, the, you know, the great masters of art used to use these. So um, is that a possible way where they were just... Uh, uh, reproducing without any, you know, of their own creativity, or do you think there was some other technologies that were at play as well? It could have been a bit of all. It's hard to guess because when mm. you go to research these things, you're just not going to find anything. You know, you have to surmise all these things while you're studying, you're reading lies and trying to get the truth from the lies. And then you, you know, you have to come up with your own, so I would say it was all three, renovating the frescoes, using camera obscura, and doing it themselves. Well, the, the mm -hmm. artist that jumps out the most is Francisco Goya, because he was a deviation from what I call the classic generic genre of the Renaissance because he, 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 his people were more expressive and he was the, the, almost the forerunner for expressionism, even for abstract art and a lot of things. And we should take another look at him. He's really outstanding an artist, but you, you wouldn't have been able to interchange him with Leonardo um, or say Michelangelo or Raphael because those three together could work together on, on, on a fresco and they were interchangeable because it was classic generic. So it, it's either, mm -hmm. either or. Then they, there are some schools of thought that think they did have this incredible technology. Like when you look at the number of outdoor sculptures adorning all of these beautiful Tartari buildings all over the world, their perfection of their anatomies, proportion, horses, they're so perfect and there's millions of them. So there's no way that some Joe guy was sitting there chiseling them out because there's just so many. They must have had some form of technology where they were, were produced and especially that famous, it's in, it's in a, a little chapel in Naples and it's that fisherman talking to a young boy and the, the fisherman's net is perfect and it's in marble and there's no way you could ever have chiseled that out. The marble would have cracked. So yes, they had the tech. I hear they, Jay told me that he said those, that the paintings were tech. They were like, um, one micron uh yes the size of a hair thickness of a hair that that uh that floored me that one so i'm sure they had that but then when the infiltrators our adversaries came in they made sure that that technology was hidden and and that we didn't have mm -hmm. access to it that one sculpture now, is francisco you... francesco queer queerolo uh, there, if you guys want to look that up, and I'm looking at it right now, and it's it's pretty remarkable. That's that's marvel. 
Now, you were also telling Jay um, about a sculpture of the girl with the curl in her forehead, and it looked almost like a sequential photograph. Yep. There's that little girl, marble, and she's she obviously she was caught in time in her absolute perfection where you could see every little cotton stitch on her clothing. And then she must have moved and they took another one and the curl in the middle of her forehead has moved and a little wrinkle here maybe or the, you know, the stitching over here. So that to me does tell me that they had some incredible technology that was able to reproduce 3D imagery. That or she was the real girl and they had the ones that came and usurped the realm. I had some like Medusa type technology and just turned these people to stone. <laughs> yes, I hate to think of that, you know, and I, I've thought of that too. And there was in San Severo, there was that prince he was a very evil prince and he was called, he was nicknamed uh, Leonardo, the Leonardo of that time because he was filling bodies with inks and playing with deteriorating flesh. And it's the chapel of San Severo. If you go in there and have a look at that, go down to the basement, obviously online, or book your ticket now <laughs> and go and have a look at that. And you'll see, and that is right when the Illuminati came into being in 1776. It was established, obviously, in Bavaria, but it was in Italy too. And I believe that these Roman Catholics had been running around the world, slaughtering and pillaging. And think of the Cathars alone in the south of France, 500,000 of these beautiful spiritual people. And they, the world had had enough of them and they knew that the Jesuits were at the root of it. So they, they weren't, the Catholic church had to find another way to infiltrate society. And I believe the Illuminati was their secret arm that went out into the world to fulfill the mission. Although I have no proof of this or anything. I'd, I love some feedback on that. If you know, do you think that's what happened? Well, which some of the things you're describing are uh, eerily reminiscent of my first year in school where on day one, you're issued a cadaver and then that cadaver lives with you for an entire year, you know, through dissection. And, uh, you know, I just, I just never got over that. And then of course you're in a lab with a bunch of other students and you've got all these, uh, you know, these trolleys with dead bodies on them. And by the end of the year, they're all in pieces. And, and then, of course, we learn things, uh, you know, like in osteopathy, you do a lot with the cranium because the cranium moves. It has to, otherwise you'd be dead. And then the medical profession says, no, that's impossible. The sutures are calcified and they don't move. Well, that's because they, they, they study death. But when you take a, a living, you know, biological entity, everything is moving and pliable. And more than that, it is receiving divine intelligence every single moment and knows what to do. So um, yeah, the modern contemporary or the uh, medical profession is just a death cult. Uh, while we're on those kinds of cults, uh, sorry for jumping all over the place here, but yeah, a little while ago, you talked about, um, you know, currency, and the Medici's, of course, which brings us into the follow the money principle. And they really had to, you know, bring us into what you describe having to earn a living. Uh, you, you know, with, if you just think about that concept, earn a living. Uh, it, it's so amazing that we go for it. But this brings us into new levels of personage uh, through additional pronouns. Now, in the whole banking system, and I'll make this real quick. They brought us into these contracts so that they can use our currency through a medium called money. And through our own ignorance, we signed a contract. And the first personage, of course, was person, which is illegal. And we go and we say, oh, that's us. And we sign on a dotted line. But now you have all these new pronouns that are being legalized, which gives them more control so that people are identifying with a myriad of different personages that all bring us under contract into their slavery system. So I think that's something that's really missed 
uh, in the dialogue out there as far as what this whole transgender movement is really about. Of course, uh, they never do anything unless there's many levels of benefit, but that is a big one. And I don't hear people talk about that, but that's very obvious what they're doing. Mike, do you have anything is, to say? Glenn? Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating, Bear, because there are a lot of people coming hip to the whole person versus living man. That's why I always say living man, living woman, because that's where our divine um, equity comes from. And of course, they flipped the whole idea of equity, right? around to uh, go against divine equity and be more about um, making the plane or making it fair for everybody and stealing from others to give to others and all that. But back to the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati, but, I mean, they're, but they're just, uh, the, the, yeah. the whole point of that was uh, the goal is to separate us from the living man, the divinity yep. and bring us into an artificiality. So uh, that's just another way they're doing it. Yep. And with the creation oh, of the corp, corp, the corporation, the corpse, we've gone over this a lot. It, they're all dead. That's the, it's a death cult. And that's what I was kind of going to go into with the Illuminati. It, it, I think there's a, there's an ancient sort of um, lineage that goes back to these mystery schools predating the Roman times, predating even, you know, Egyptian times where there's been sort of this occulted uh, death worship. And as you say, Jane, these, you know, literally soulless ones, uh, which is a really interesting idea. And maybe they are in a trap. They they can't ascend. They're you know they're stuck here, and so they've been um, doing all sorts of um, nefarious deeds in the underground. But now I think we're at the point where it's kind of amazing because you did have the Illuminati and that one of the Fabian socialists, and you had of course the they infiltrated the Masonic order, and they have all, had you know. Modern Times, Council Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Bilderberg, we know all this, the Club of Rome. Now they're just out in the open. It's the World Economic Forum. It's Klaus Schwab. It's like globalism is here. The globalist, they're like, they're all out in the open now. And that's kind of a beautiful thing because we can have that, we can have that conversation now with the fellow awake people and show to others like, Yes, it's scary because it is scary because we are at that time. We're at that pivotal time where we all need to finally make the decision of where we want to go with our ascension pathway. Um, however, it's also the beautiful time because we're all here for that reason. So, um, yeah, but I, I'm a firm believer that globalism is here. It started in 2020 with the coronation. And uh, the same ones that took out Tartaria, they're going for their final plan right now. And it's great that we are able to have these conversations because I don't think a lot of people back in the day when they were doing the resets had the ability to have these conversations. I think they were being done in sort of the, the uh, mystery schools of the light, if you will, you know, um, and they weren't able to get this conversation out to the masses like we can now. So I think we have a great opportunity using their own technology against them to push this awareness to as many people as we can right now. Well, it's not even, it doesn't even end at transhumanism. It's, it's already moved to post-human, which is even <laughs> a new um, modern art, contemporary art movement. You can find post-human art already infiltrating oh. into the psyche of the masses. And, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to realize that they own every magazine, advertise, you know, they own it all. So... It just they just feed it through that machine into the realm of of everyone on earth constantly. And we cannot forget the power of that symbology and how it affects the collective consciousness, unconsciousness on a massive level. And even if we were to just do one thing and ask ourselves every time we look at something, what am I actually looking at? We might make a little bit of a headway as to just shield ourselves from this very invasive way of infiltrating our whole mental psyche of just by a glance, you know, like, oh, that just reminds me of this one artist I'm studying right now. He's Chinese. And I don't remember his name. There are many lately, many, many, many Chinese modern artists that are just 
reaching the top, the pinnacle of the art world. This gentleman in particular, he takes a real Hun Dynasty vase and he'll, he paints Coca-Cola around it. And he's got a whole series of them. And, and one of his art, I don't know what to call it really. All he does is he drops one of these million dollar Hun Dynasty vases onto the ground and smashes it and takes a photograph of it. So this, this, this awful disregard for uh, traditions, customs, it's all embodied in that, but you aren't thinking that, you're thinking, God, he just smashed a million dollar vase. But the psychological message behind that is forget about tradition, forget about our incredible history. You know, that's what they want us to do, the great forgetting, academentia. Now we have some world leaders, uh, most notably Vladimir, who um, released uh, maps of Tartaria. And uh, I've, I've read different uh, people's take about who he really is and maybe uh, his historical, you know, family lines and everything. Um, anything you can embellish about that? Well, I would judge a man by their actions. I would mm -hmm. say that he's getting a terrible rap, obviously, for this war in Ukraine. But the thing is, what preceded the war that is important, and it was that he threw the, the central banking system out of Russia and then never allowed to go back. He also got all the BRICS countries together, uh, China, Russia, India, South Africa, was it Brazil, I think? And then, Brazil. yeah, and, and he got all those people together. He had meetings in Russia with them and they sought to undermine this terrible central banking system that tried to undermine us through the power of, 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 of the, through monetary power, which they use for every single thing indeed that they do, whether it's um, blackmail or whatever it is, they use that money to maintain control. So he's he's done that and now he's gone into Ukraine, which is, let's say uh, it's Kazaria, that's the Kazarian mafia. He's out for the Kazarian mafia. He knows who they are. He knows that they took on the mantle of the Jewish people in name only, just like the Catholic church took on the mantle of the true Christians in order to operate around the world, you know, that's where you get the anti-Semitism lines. And, and so by judging by his actions, I would say that even though it doesn't appear that way to the masses, he is doing everything he can in his power to bring the power back to the people and the sovereigns of the world through a new banking system that overrides the central banking system that has ruled and stolen and pillaged from us on a daily basis forever. And, and releasing Tartarian maps would suggest that he's uh, wanting to resurrect the old empire. He's just set the dogs off to find the information and boy, did they deliver. <laughs> yeah. They came back with big bones. <laughs> And without Quite that, you know, without that, without that, where would we be now? We'd still be in the dark. We wouldn't know all of this tech existed or, or everything. It's, it's huge what he did. Yet, obviously, in this world, he's perceived as a tyrant. And, and that's very sad. But the truth will eventually come out and people will be able to see beyond the immediate devastation of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we will mm -hmm. say that the the few that we've spoken to that live in that country, and we had a guest recently, Alosha, on um, life in Russia is pretty sweet from what they've been telling us that because we hear a lot of times in the West that um, it's basically roaming gangs and it's 
you know, uh, pretty lawless and very expensive and um, the people are barely getting by. But from what we've been hearing, actually, um, they're kind of going through a new renaissance themselves. Uh, it is interesting. It would be interesting to see because they don't have like certain elements of industry that other countries have. And will they be instead of going down the typical, um, I don't know, the reset. Um, uh, I don't even know what you call the the denizens of the reset, the ones that took over the Rockefeller types, right? Those industrialists. But it'd be great to see them start developing technology that's more in line with the ether and with sort of the old school Antiquitech coming out with vehicles that are bare hovering and <laughs> flying around using new types of energies that are old types of energies. Because that then I think the world will really start to see through all the lies and go, wow, these people are actually doing things that, you know, um, aren't reliant upon scientism and the control matrix. I'll start really believing in the Putin narrative when I start seeing more of that. Um, but it is very interesting. I'm still kind of open to everything. I, I I I do know some people that actually went over there and to fight for, believe it or not, like I had a fellow firefighter here who was so sold on the narrative from CNN. He he's volunteered himself is in the trenches fighting right now. Um, and so that kind of mind control is spellbounding, spellbounding. But my, I still have questions about like, do we need this amount of violence and destruction? to have the revolution. I don't know. And, and also the question is what's really going on over there. Um, it's a lot mm -hmm. of fog of war and propaganda. So yeah, it's a fascinating topic. I've had, um, I've had some intimate relationships with scientists uh, types over there uh -huh. and they are very much encouraged by their government to really go into research and in what we would consider paranormal and things. Um, and a lot of uh, medical techniques that I've employed over the years were from there based on their research, also based on technology that they developed from their research. And it's doing everything you're talking about, Michael. And uh, so, you know, one thing I do know firsthand is in that profession, they have much more freedom to develop things and research things than the institutionalized uh, community over here. And uh, you know what I always find comical. We're always hearing about how dangerous it is everywhere, and how you know. And then oh, <laughs> you know, oh, you mean it's uh, you know we're the best place because we've got these utopian uh, you know city centers like Chicago and New York and LA. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, we've devolved into the worst of the worst here. And then we're always being sold that it's, you know, it's actually very bad somewhere else. Well, friends I have that are in places everywhere from Mexico to, you know, Russia and places like that, they're saying, you know, actually we're having a pretty good time. There's something about Russia that we can't forget as well. Remember Edgar Casey? he said, out of Russia shall come the hope. Of the world exactly exactly and the other thing and about Russia, sorry putin not, putin's got yeah. up in the game too because that was his ancestors that were the tartarians and they were a lot of them were slaughtered by the bolsheviks we're also exactly. big fans of the anastasia reading cedars books if you've ever read those jane yeah. um, i started um, reading them yeah Yep. And, uh, and we've, we've been working with the uh, Anastasia Foundation here in the United States. Gabriel Miguel is doing wonderful work, helping people get on, back on the land and be sovereign with land patents and all that. So there's a heritage and tradition coming out of Russia right now that's influencing the West. That's pretty awesome. Now, you really piqued my interest in your conversation with Jay, where you felt like you had a, a good idea of where Mary Magdalene really uh, sought uh, refuge from, and, and you know, I've read all the material, the original, the the messianic prophecy, and the the one before the what was the name of it, Mike? It, it's what the um, the blo Holy Blood, Holy Grail was yep. built on. And anyway, the the Rene, uh, I'll I'll blow it here, Rene de Chateau, where supposedly that one doctor or the priest who was overseeing all these things that were in the the uh, you know, kept in the cellar of this one, uh, you know, country church there. So uh, that's that's a really fun story. And I've just always been fascinating with that because of the whole Merovingian bloodline and so forth. So 
uh, what have you found that where you think where she really ended up? Well, this was very unexpected for me on my tour around France that I could never leave because I just kept going back to France. I got stuck in France. Um, and I happened upon this, it's called A Brie de la Madeleine. And it was such a cute little place and it had this just cute little church in it. And I like looking around and well, what's this place? And then I went to the archeologists and uh, I found that they had named this particular site handkerchief. And um, that was my first like, hmm, that's an odd name for a site. And then I found out that the, the, the skulls and the bones of the body of this human that they had found at first, they said it was a, a man. But, and then years went by and they said, oh, no, 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 it's a, it's a woman, but it's a girl, it's a girl. Then more years go by and now all of a sudden this skeleton is older. So now what does that say? It's an older woman. And the fact that they called it handkerchief, to me in that time Othello would have, would have been a really powerful story. And Othello was all about the handkerchief that the wife betrayed the husband, which she didn't. But that was my clue there that this woman they found was basically had cheated on her husband. And we all know how much the Roman Catholic Church hates Mary Magdalene, called her a harlot. They have <laughs> even Magdalenian institutions all over the world for wayward women. And then when they got this so-called Neanderthal, well, it was Magdalenian culture. They named it, the Roman priests named those, they named it Magdalenian culture and they shipped it to the United States, first of all, to New York in 1926. And then it ended up at the Field Museum in Chicago where it was put on display lying on its back, even though it had been in a fetal position. That was another clue to me that has connotations, the way you display that. And they hyped it up so much. And when they had sent the skeleton across to the United States, they had labeled it as a deceased soldier. So even that was hidden and all this hiding, hiding, hiding. And then the, the, what the, the, there's two, two other things was someone had painted some kind of chemical on these bones and, and, and everyone was so aghast because that had just ruined the dating for them. And then now they couldn't date it. It made it much seem much more modern. And then we've got Fomenko telling us that Christ and Mary Magdalene, well, not Christ. He was saying Christ did roam the earth in the 10th century. And Mary Magdalene was roaming around all through the southern France where these caves are during the 10th century, which isn't that long ago. It's so that, you know, they needed old bones for their story. But the, then the cherry on the top for me was when they took that exact skull and made a face from it as if it was living. And then they shipped that off to Lasso to be part of the the Stone Age prehistoric exhibition of the Magdalenian culture at Lasso, France, the most famous fake, fake upon fake cave that you, because it, it's a replica of the original that you could ever have. And so here we, the, here the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has successfully bombed their Mary Magdalene, the harlot, all the way back to the Stone Age. And they would get some kind of delightful pleasure out of that. I am sure. Absolutely. I think it was. So Anatoly Flamenco's timeline would put Jesus at about a thousand years ago. Well, during that, he, his timeline says that Christ was born in 1053. And there was a certain mm -hmm. um, astronomical thing going on in the sky at the time. I forget. I'd have to go to my notes to look at what it was. And um, 
Yeah, so that, that puts it also much, much closer to modern times, which makes it more of a spiritual threat to these Roman Catholics that were running around France trying to promote the whole notion of prehistoricism itself. And they had the, they had um, Abbe Brule, the father of prehistory, known as the prehistoric pope, running around approving all these cave paintings and they had <laughs> Bossoni doing the skulls and they also had Teilhard de Chardin as well running around China and the guy that found the Peking man. <clears throat> so they had it all working. Mm. To, oh, and then the other thing is that the, the gospel of Mary Magdalene was discovered in, in 1897 but the whole world didn't know about this until 1983. And right when they found those Gnostic scriptures of Mary Magdalene herself was when they went into high gear with this prehistoric psych story and ran around quickly discovering lots more caves and evidence. And so that it would rebut, you know, when finally they let this information out about who these people, these Cathars, they were such amazing spiritual people. They were the antithesis of what the Roman Catholic Church was. The Roman Catholic Church itself in 1917 used the Pope to create this decree to make a usury legal within the church, right when all these Catholic, right when all these um, world fairs were going on because they were just anticipating this huge surge in industry and manufacturing and all of this stuff, so, which would enrich them. And that was the opposite of what the Cathars and Mary Magdalene were. They were purely spiritual. They were organic. In fact, I go as far as to say that synthetic is satanic and Gnostic is organic. The, this is my conclusion after looking and looking at these two back to back. That that definitely wraps it up. Have you found any uh, evidence of the Merovingian bloodline still alive and well and uh, functioning in any capacity? In my brief sojourn into France, I there's a side part of me that wants to really run run over there and go and look but i'm you know i'm so busy with this disgusting modern art right now i haven't <laughs> looked yet but it, i find the whole merovingian bloodline thing absolutely fascinating and i know that my original name was de evershed and i do come from our family line comes from france originally which makes me want to i have an affinity with the south of France, let's say, that I would love to look into it, not just because I think I'm, you know, connected, but just because I know I have family roots there in some form. Unfortunately, I have family bloodlines uh, on the Italian side that uh, go into the papacy and uh, everybody over there, my relatives are are very uh, proud of the fact that we have a, a pope in our direct lineage and even kept the family name. He's the only pope, uh, Pope Lando, that kept uh, the family name instead of adapting a new one. Interestingly, wow. and that was in the 900s, allegedly, and uh, his claim to fame is he had the shortest papacy ever so either he just died or he was off real quick. So anyway, um, was that something that I don't. That was only two apart. months. The, the length of his papacy, two months. Oh, I don't know about how many months, but it was uh, the shortest papacy on record. I don't know the exact time, but it was in, I think it was a matter of months. The, I saw a Pope that only lasted two months when I, when I was doing my research. That, that was that was probably him. And if you look it up, that's our family name. And uh, you go over there and the name's all over in certain towns and everything. So, well, uh, Mayor, so you, give us uh, hope. you give us hope <laughs> that we can have breakaways. <laughs> he must have gone down in the basement. <laughs> Saw what was happening. So, um, oh, you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have any... Um, 
uh, thing you can share with us about your other work into the divine feminine so we can kind of round out the discussion and then in the process uh, share links where you know we can find your work uh, find your book which i'm going to order immediately after this show today and um, you know just anything I'd, you'd like to share here well i have a website you know i'm just so not um business oriented at all <laughs> i literally <laughs> live in this dream world of painting and research and if if some money happens to come my way i'm like so thankful and so i don't do a lot of promotion or anything like that but mm. my paintings are for sale on my website janeevershedart.com and um i i do commissions I, I do commission pieces i've done quite a few of those lately and then I do consult art consultations to people who are maybe need a little boost or they want someone to look at their art and do an assessment and a redirection or a, a, a boost. Or if they're, um, they felt like they were an artist at one time and they became art frozen and then bring them out of that and into the world of creation again, I do that. And I do a myriad of different things but um, yeah, I'm just not really that business oriented. As far as the divine feminine goes, I don't isolate it into one thing. There's the divine feminine and the divine masculine, and we need to stay that way because the greatest threat to us right now is transhumanism and posthumanism. And um, all of this nonsense of mutilating our children before they even have the desire to have children themselves is an absolute insanity and a crime against humanity disguised as this virtue signaling thing like oh we feel so sorry nobody understands you well you haven't become an adult you haven't fully grown into your body and we find that so many of these people regret it afterwards too and commit suicide on, at an alarming rate so i'll just say i have compassion for everyone but not i i, I really don't understand how they can now brainwash children into deciding that they were born with the wrong sex well and it's not even just brainwashing it's institutionalized because in north carolina they just showed it just came out that doctors were having programs for as young as two years old so children aren't even speaking and decisions are being made for them so uh this is an institutionalized it's been um funded by soros like um you know NGOs. So literally we're funding it in many ways ourselves. Uh, and so this is a, uh, as Bear and I often say, the answer is decentralization and knowing each individual's power. And when we each just come to our own power, right, um, we become that bright node of awakening that will then influence the field and help others awaken themselves. And so um, I think what we've been seeing is, is they pull the they pulled the shade over a lot of people's eyes over decades and well thousands of years from that power, and replaced it with bad, dirty electricity, uh, fake money, <laughs> all these other things that are supposed to power lives. But really, it's as you were saying, Jane, earlier, it's all in here. It's the light inside us, which is the creative spark. So let's then, all. Get a paintbrush out, guys, and and paint something and see where it goes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, Mike. But I also want to say, too, <laughs> that both of you are wonderful, and I have loved sitting here and having this talk. I mean, you just brought out my, like, excitement about everything that I think. So thank you for that wonderful opportunity. Oh, well, thank you. It's been such a pleasure, and uh, I hope we stay connected from here on. I would love to. Yes, please. Uh, let's stay connected. And for everybody who wants to follow Jane's work, we'll have all the links in the show notes below. And please go show her some love. And hopefully you're inspired to uh, find that creative spark today, whether that be going out in the garden or even in, in, in athletics, right? For me, I'm going to try to go surf maybe today. <laughs> I still suck, but 
Uh, it's something I love to do right now. So find something you love to do that's passionate, that's ideally connected to the, the world, right? Connected to this beautiful world we're on and we're in or plane or whatever you want to call it. And as I always end the talk, remember to get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go uh, plant something, go for a hike, go show mother nature some love. She is the answer. Uh, go hug a tree. And uh, we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Join us on Unite if you can or Rumble or uh, Odyssey if you or YouTube. And we love you guys and enjoy your weekend. Thanks. Bye-bye.